So it's Bob here, KD4 BMG, and I'm here with? Ray Novak, N9JA with ICOM America. Yeah, so I think we all pretty much know that this is the face of uh, ICOM to those of us that are ham radio operators. So the most new thing that you have today, of course, new was the IC705 a couple of years ago, the ID52A. New today is what? The IC905. Okay. That is our, what we're calling the SHF project uh, at Dayton but now we have an actual product name for it and a functioning radio. Okay, and who, who's the audience? Who do you think mostly would be interested in this and uh, have the, the, the greatest amount of interest in use case? The, ma the basic audience for this is your everyday ham. Okay. One that's played around with something like the 705, they've enjoyed using QRP, going out doing soda and POTA work but now you've got new bands that you can go activate. Okay, all right. A couple of questions related, but not to a specific radio. So I know you're on the business development end of things. I work in supply chain management for the last 30 years of my life. I'm in uh, defense contracting. So I know in my world, electronic components is a real challenge. So yeah, when it's something- It's been really touch and go lately. Yeah, so when something new comes up like this, are you? Do you know on the operations side of things? Are they primarily looking at components that are early in their life cycle? Or are they going out and buy, doing long-term buys or multi-year buys? Or is that kind of so far outside of your purview that you're not really sure quite how they handle that? ICOM's engineering philosophy is based on two levels. One is performance. The other one is technology. To look at those two areas, you can't look at yesterday's parts to expect fulfillment going forward. So we're, we're always looking ahead. There's no such thing anymore as future-proof. So you do the best that you can with the components that you're looking forward on. Okay. One of the key things that we're looking at are um, NATO-friendly components. Okay. Ones that we don't have to worry about what's hidden in the back, back door area. Okay, smart. Are you seeing, and again, I know you're on the business development side of things, is ICOM seeing any softening in the market, or I should say more rational activity in the market as far as availability, both from a labor perspective and a component perspective, or are things as tight as they were, say, two and a half, three years ago when things really got out of hand? Well, one of the lucky things for us is we own our own factories in, in Japan. Okay. Uh, some of the thought process that goes behind it, Japan's notorious for earthquakes, our two factories are on separate tectonic plates, so that kind of thinking goes into it that we don't have a, God forbid, an a earthquake happens that destroys both factories. Okay. We're gotcha. always looking at how do we keep keep things going. Okay. Also, our engineering pool, it, our ICOM engineers, we do not contract that out. So we can control the products that we design and look at enhancing over the years. There's always what we call continually improvement team. So they're always looking at how can we make the product better. Okay. And right now, not so much in the amateur radio side of it, but in our marine and aviation, we've had to recertify all of our products because components, Okay. So the components like a PLL circuit, what you're supposed to do is when you re-engineer it with a new PLL circuit, that changes the characteristics, so we must resubmit it to the FCC. Okay. So we, we make sure we follow those type of protocols when we're doing our engineering. Okay. One more question for you. Um, I know ICOM does a lot of market research. You have to in, in yes. your industry and in your business. Rumor was there was a shift in demographic in ham radio back around when the pandemic first started and a lot of people became interested in the emergency preparedness. Is that shift, are you aware, is that shift still taking place? Is this still becoming a younger demographic or do you guys not have visibility to that? Just, just a curiosity question. I wouldn't say it's a younger demographic. Um, as far as emergency preparedness, that hasn't changed in the last 20 years. Okay. Uh, one, and I'm kind of smiling when I'm saying this because a gentleman that just walked up in our audience approached me at Dayton, let's see, 2001. So over 20 years ago when we introduced D-Star. And what we did is we filled the D-Star booth full of users. 
he comes up to me at our main booth and told me I cost him a lot of money because instead of having ICOM salespeople to talk to him, I had users. Okay. So he ended up financing. He ended up financing the entire state of Alabama for D Star at Dayton in 2000, 2001 or two thousand four. Four or five. But, but back again, you're talking about the, the demographics in that. The innate nature of the hobby, and it's actually written in Part 97, that we're supposed to be there for emergency communications. So we've seen people that are in the medical profession, first responder professions, be a big part of amateur radio. So, no, I really haven't seen that part change, okay. not because of emergency communications. What I've seen... The change is the new, some of the new education, the STEM programs, looking for a new angle to tying multiple things into the curriculum. Okay. Am amateur radio, if you talk to any of the old timers, they don't remember countries geographically. They will remember by the call sign prefixes. Okay. Good point. So you look at, you got geography. You got physics, you've got solar weather, um, what happens daytime versus nighttime with elect electrons, RF. I mean, amateur radio has is pretty much the Swiss Army knife of education. Right. There is so much that is covered by it. That's where I'm seeing the, the demographics shift. Okay. A couple of thoughts. So. My shack radio is an FT991A. New ham when I got it. So I wanted, I thought I would only ever own one radio. Oh, no. So everyone in the audience is laughing, laughing at me right now. Yes. So I got a, you know, a shack in the box. Now I own many radios. Years later, if I were doing a video on what radio would be my first HF radio, it would be the 7300. I have an IC705. Just decided to pick up the ID52A. Now the IC705 and the ID52A that's kind of like my emergency preparedness. And I, I decided to pair those two, and again, I haven't done that video, spoiler alert here. Common thinking in, in the user interface, batteries going back and forth between the two units. So kudos to ICOM. I don't know if that was part of the marketing or thinking, but oh, yeah. uh, from my perspective, that's what made me decide to make the investment in that ID52A. Got a nice deal at Christmas time. It's an expensive radio. Fantastic radio, but that's my pairing for emergency preparedness. See, you just mentioned one thing. You made the comment about it was an expensive radio. When you take a look at the use that you've gotten out of it yeah. and the enjoyment, oh yes, it's, yes, it's not that expensive at that point. When yeah. when you're sitting there shelling out the money, thinking, what am I going to do with this radio? At the very yeah. beginning, you do have a little bit of sticker shock, but. After oh, all the things that you end up doing with it, though. It's money spent with no regret because of how uh, functional it is, the enjoyment that I get out of it, and the preparedness that I'll have with it long term. So, one final comment. Now, one thing yeah, for you. Ahead. You're talking about the 705 and the user interface. Yes. Our most expensive radio is right behind you. Its, Emma, it's street price is right at $13,000. Okay. Looks intimidating with all the knobs, doesn't it? <laughs> it? It does. It does look intimidating. Does anything look familiar, though? Yes, it does. <laughs> the user interface looks quite familiar. Yes. Yeah. And that's been one of the things that I've enjoyed. I've, I've seen different reviewers of our product, and there was actually a couple of comments when we launched the 52. Oh, well, it doesn't look any different than the 51 other than the color screen <laughs> until you really start playing with the radio. Right, right. And our, our philosophy is, if it works, why change it? Yes. And I, I even made some tongue-in-cheek comments going, do I really need to screw up the user interface for you to fully believe that <laughs> exactly. it's a new radio? Well, well, no, right? And that's one of the, the benefits of, of ICOM. So, listen, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. All right. Thank All right. you. Hope the show goes well for you. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right.